Hello, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Five Things Every IT Manager Should Understand About Today's Office in the Cloud. Today's webinar is part of the four-part series called The Modern Office, where we are diving deep into new technologies and tools offices are deploying to maximize productivity across the entire business. We appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us. There are a couple of housekeeping items we'd like to mention before we begin. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please either raise your hand so that we can unmute you or submit them through the GoToWebinar question box. We'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Before we begin, we wanted to share a brief background on the Socius and Rosebud partnership. Socius is a strategic business consulting partner that provides comprehensive business management solutions that help companies leverage technology to accelerate their growth and profitability and compete more successfully in today's economy. Rosebud Technologies provides the intellectual capital for customers to align technology with their business objectives. Rosebud's role is to be a proactive member of the client team, providing technology capability for the business and focusing on building and sustaining a client-centric relationship. Through our partnership, Socius and Rosebud offer a complete connected technology solution, enabling your ERP, CRM, and office all to work as one. So at this point, Greg, I believe we're ready to transition over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. As was mentioned, this uh, session is about security and privacy and your data and how it's been cared for in the cloud, uh, specifically with Office 365, of course. And we're going to get started right away. We're going to cover we're going to cover five basic areas that we felt was important to call attention to um, as regard to your business, your data, and how it exists in the cloud. Um, for the first thing, we're going to start with data center hosting. Where is this stuff and what is Microsoft doing to safeguard your information? Uh, there are security services included with Office 365 and Microsoft Online. We'll cover a handful of those as well and discuss what each of those means and how you can take advantage of them. Mobile device management is a big deal, especially in today's world. A lot of your staff um, probably have more than one device. In fact, uh, it used to be that a company would provide uh, a smartphone, say, to their staff. I think those days are beginning to wane and come to an end because oftentimes your staff probably has a better device than what might be provided by the company. And so this falls under the name of bring your own, bring your own device. And so mobile device management is a key place where uh, in a business can maintain um, management and some ownership of the data that might exist on those devices. And we'll show some examples of that. In addition to that, plus when you're working in a cloud enabled world, the idea of sharing and collaborating with people around us, uh, both inside our organization, maybe they're in a different office than us, or with third parties, uh, vendors, business partners, customers, prospects. Uh, how can we engage with them easily by using this, these services? And, and finally, I know from a technical standpoint, being able to access your information from wherever you are not only has it been an interesting solution in the past, but today it's more interesting because it's quite honestly very easy. And so we'll talk a bit about that and um, try not to get overly technical in any of these things here, but please make a note of any questions as we go through these slides or um, comments or concerns um, that you may have for your own business or uh, questions that you're bringing to the table that you'd like to have answered today. So. These are the areas that we're going to cover. Um, certainly the, the question and answer at the end, uh, that part of the, our session will be open game for anything you'd like to ask about the topic. And um, I hope uh, by the end of this, you'll have a better understanding of uh, what's included and how your data is uh, secured and protected by Office 365 and Microsoft Online Services. And of course, that uh, you, hopefully you feel more comfortable about it. 
And I always like to call attention to um, how in a business and like your own, it's important how from the top down the business is managed. And I think it's really important to call out um, a comment, um, one of many, that the new uh, CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, he's been in place a little over a year. Uh, right when he started, he had a speech he gave, and one of the things he said there is here on the side, businesses and users are going to use technology only if they can trust it. So Microsoft really does take this very seriously, particularly from a top-down perspective. Everything they're building is done very carefully and with security in mind. So with that, let's, let's move on and let's hit our first topic here about data center hosting. Microsoft has what are called regional data centers. They're placed all around the world and they do that because their customer base is, is, a, is a global customer. And uh, in each of those regions, there are certain criteria that must be met. And so region by region, there may be some issues or some standards that are met here or there. Uh, but by and large, all of these data centers adhere to all of those requirements, whether they be in Asia or Europe, South America, uh, or here in North America. In all of those cases, there is both physical and digital security being employed. From a physical standpoint, uh, the engineers and folks who are responsible for maintaining the health of the environment they only have what's called just-in-time access. So it's not like your data is sitting out there on a Microsoft server somewhere and anybody in the data center can have access and go look at stuff. That is not the case. In fact, even when an engineer, because there might be a case where you have to engage Microsoft for support, and they may have to engage a th another engineer in support that maybe specializes, say, in SharePoint or Exchange, that those engineers have what's called zero access privilege. And this comes from this, uh, the basis of give nobody access to nothing except what they need access to. So they build out um, a request really to allow an engineer to have access to your data with only the exact privileges that they need to deal with that issue. And all of those requests further go along into an audit log that is looked at manually to make sure that no other breach, inadvertently as it might have been, was made. They're constantly fine-tuning that capability so that engineers are not poking around and don't have access to things that they shouldn't have. Of course, even physically in the data center, there is multi-factor uh, authentication. So, um, you know, picture gates and, and guard towers and um, no gun turrets, but just the same. It's very secure. Um, biometric scanning and those types of things, even to have physical access to the data center. Uh, I had a conversation recently with a customer uh, that was looking to um, have data stored in, in Microsoft data centers, and one of their owning companies said no, because in a banking industry, they really want to have someone be able to access and go into and visit the data center. Well, Microsoft data centers are so secure that an unbadged person just simply can't come in. So it was kind of a, a no in terms of hosting things there, but as a benefit for everybody else, well, that makes me feel more assured that my data is safe because only people who have access to the data center will even physically be allowed into the building. And finally, in terms of a physical nature, of course, you can imagine there are water coolers, there are diesel generators, there's days worth of um, power and energy on site in case there was an electrical outage of some kind, uh, multiple points of entry for internet and bandwidth, Plus, of course, you got to have seismic bracing. So if there was an earthquake, the data centers will be able to rock and not roll um, off the grid, um, so to speak, and uh, your data, again, will be very safe inside this physical structure. In addition, from a digital's perspective, this is where things get kind of cool and we have to calm down our technical spirits here, but as you store files on these servers as part of, say, SharePoint or OneDrive or your email data and attachments that might be in those emails, it's important to know that the data stored on those hard drives, because just like you have a hard drive in your computer, there's hard drives in these data centers. Those files are encrypted individually. Every single file has a unique encryption key. In fact, if you were to go and make a modification to one of those files, like this PowerPoint presentation, I think has gone through nine iterations. Each one of those nine iterative file changes to this PowerPoint, for example, has its own unique key. 
very, very secure. And the public key is not available. You just you can't have access to this information unless you have the other side of that encryption key to be able to open it up and see it. And that's also encrypted at rest. So as the file sits there on the disk, it's encrypted. So the thought of having a drive be pulled out of a server and some be able, you know, someone it falls into bad hands and someone can you know, open up that disk, it will be of no use to them. In, in fact, the file could be split across multiple disks, in which case having one hard drive will not do you any good. And Microsoft routinely destroys hard drives. Um, they're recorded, they're audited, and confirmed in terms of the destruction. So, so even if a hard drive goes bad, the data there is still destructed properly. It's also important to realize that as you're connected to these services from, say, Outlook, um, the data is encrypted in transit. Um, a hacking term is called a man-in-the-middle attack. So you've got your computer at one end and Microsoft at the other end in their data center, and the idea is that somebody can pick up that, that, that um, data in transit in the middle somewhere and kind of listen in so they can pick up what's there and you would never know the difference. Well, this is encrypted end to end. Uh, so in transit from your computer to Microsoft, there's no capability to have what's called the man in the middle attack where they can listen in because it's, in, it's fully encrypted. Plus, it's important to realize, and we mentioned this in our last webinar, that your company in Office 365, in, in Microsoft Online Services, your company and its data does coexist on physical infrastructure with other companies, but they're isolated. So Microsoft employs strict data isolation so that while you might have data on similar or same hard drives as a myriad of other companies, your data is siloed and isolated away from everybody else. This all comes from a basic premise where um, it's called defense in depth. It's an industry standard that um, Global companies like Microsoft that are hosting data and, and providing services like this, software and technology services, adhere to. And it's a very strict requirement that you provide adequate security for both physical and digital elements of the data. And the little circle graph here shows you, and I, I love this image, that you start with this perimeter of physical security because that really physically is what's happening. You've got this building and it's secured and it's got lots of security measures placed upon it. And as you go down layers, you start to enter into, all right, now I have an application like Exchange for my email. How is that secured? Now, people who might be administrating that system, how are, how are they prevented from seeing my stuff if they're not supposed to have access to it? And finally, how is my data secured? So all the way down at the core of this concentric circles is your data and it has all these other provisions employed to protect it. Very, very um, keen focus on data security and data management. And um, there is uh, the data centers and the services are third party audited on a quarterly basis. Uh, Ernst and Young uh, are one of the parties that have performed these security audits in the past. Um, so it's not just Microsoft saying we've got great stuff. Third parties are, are making sure that Microsoft is adhering very strictly to these standards. So in terms of some of these other uh, security services provided by, these, um, by Office 365, um, there are several that are fairly important. And um, I want to call out just a couple because from a smaller mid-sized company standpoint, if you had the wherewithal to not only purchase the capability, the technology that it would enable these additional security services, the ability to manage them ongoing could be fairly expensive. And I am, I am speaking specifically toward having a knowledgeable employee who knows what they're doing when it comes to your business's security. So a couple that I do like to call out, uh, first of all, is the data loss prevention. I will show this a little later on about where you can find these policies that you would put upon the data and the transmission of that data. But data loss prevention is actually very difficult for any small or mid-sized company to acquire. There are third-party solutions, there are hardware solutions, there are things that you put inside your network to manage, but just the same, now you've got to be able to manage that on your own while you got to worry about your backups and your other infrastructure and getting out and make sure the end users are happy and the boss is happy and you know all those types of things. Um, if we can push those out and let Microsoft take care of them, now we've got these very talented folks that can help us out with other stuff. Another one is litigation hold. 
uh, litigation hold would be that uh, capability where if somebody in the organization was um, uh, implicated in a, in a court case, most often the court would say, okay, you need to put a hold on that person's email, their, their digital transmissions. And so that says, hey, that person can conduct uh, their email just as I usually would, but nothing from the point of the litigation hold put in, is put in place, nothing can be permanently deleted. Yes, you can delete things from your inbox and it goes to deleted items, but nothing ever is permanently deleted from that mailbox while the litigation is pending. Another service seems very simple to employ, but until Office 365, even none of my customers had this capability because it was very hard to come by and long term, very hard to support. And I guess I didn't describe, but data loss prevention is that capability where you can identify aspects of the data that says, hey, this looks like a social security number. Don't let this leave my organization. It might be a regular occurrence, particularly in an insurance type firm, to have to share that information between employees. That's okay, but don't let that information leave, quote unquote, leave my building. Don't let it leave my organization and be sent to some other party that I don't know what they're employing in terms of their encryption and their security. So that would be an example of data loss prevention. I do want to call attention to two things here. Uh, the, the, the Office 365 Trust Center. Um, I've got a little blurb there down at the bottom about what that's what that entails. But the website can be found at trustoffice365.com. And if you're interested at all at seeing the extent with which Microsoft covers these services and their security, that's the place to go. It's constantly updated. It's constantly being amended and added to in terms of the new capabilities, like Microsoft's releasing new stuff all the time, new capabilities, new services all the time. And so they've got to continually update the Trust Office 365 website with what Microsoft is doing to continually secure that information. The other one is the Office 365 service description guides. You could simply point your um, favorite search engine at that, that phrase and you'll find the website. Anything to do with online services for Microsoft has been defined in these service description guides. If that service can do that capability or perform that capability, it will be defined in the service description guide. If it can't, it, you won't find it there or they might tell you it can't do this. So that's if you have a, a particular one-off kind of situation that you're interested to know, does it do this? That would be the place at point chat. And there's a service description guide for every one of the services individually and one for that rolls up to Office 365 as a whole. So mobile device management, as we mentioned, is pretty key. Uh, one of the mantras from Microsoft, uh, beginning with Satya here, as I, I have another quote called out for him, is a cloud first, mobile first company. They realize that mobility is becoming very, very uh, key. In fact, there was an article I read recently that one in five millennials, that's a particular age group, cons they consume 100% of their information, one in five consumes 100% of their information on a mobile device. They don't use a computer or a tablet or a desktop, a laptop, doesn't matter what it is, they don't use it. They use a smartphone or they're using, say, an iPad or a Surface of some kind uh, or an Android device they actually don't have a computer at their desk and that's how they consume the information. It's 20% of millennials are, are looking at that. So those are, that's our workforce for the next 20 or 30 years. And so it's important to realize we have to be able to deliver information in meaningful ways at mobile devices, which just simply means, wow, I've got a bunch of my company data roaming around on mobile devices that aren't sitting on desks that I can walk through the building at night as I'm walking out. Oh, there's a computer, there's a computer. No, I've got mobile devices across the countryside how do I safeguard my information? And so mobile device management is a very, very important aspect of Office 365. And I'm, I'm calling out kind of a, a, a building process, a tiered structure to how Microsoft has addressed the, um, this issue. First and foremost, Office 365 in the enterprise suites. Now there are, I don't wanna get into different product mixes, but there are various products of Office 365. Uh, the best analogy is if you go up and you step up to your the counter at your favorite fast food restaurant and you're picking a number one or number two or number three, that's kind of what Office 365 is. It's still the same fast food restaurant, but you can pick different versions of, of meals that you wanna that you want to eat from. So from the Office 365 enterprise suites, um, there are certain aspects of mobile device management that are currently available. Selective wipe, device management, 
conditional access. Conditional access means, is this device allowed to connect to my data? And you can, you can put provisions in place to prevent that from happening. On top of that, you can layer on a service called Microsoft Intune, which gives you additional services and capabilities, um, policy management. You'll be able to push down a policy of here's what your, if you need to connect on a corporate VPN, here's, what, here's the information for that corporate VPN. Um, managing corporate data, so not allowing data from, say, uh, Outlook web app, which would be the Office 365 application on an Android or an iOS device, you, if you were to copy out some text from an email message and go to paste it into, say, the notes application that comes with a, an iPhone or iPad, it wouldn't allow you to do it. And that's how you can manage corporate data. So all of your corporate data can only exist on corporate managed applications on that device, um, which gets back to selective wipe. I can say, okay, maybe this person has left my company, remove these applications and the data from their device. Leave their family photos, leave their favorite music, leave their personal email, but I want you to take this stuff off that device. That's what you can do with this. And you spin up to um, Enterprise Mobility Suite, which is another layer on top of this, and now you have a full suite that includes identity and access management. We're not gonna spend time on that. I will show you some examples uh, in Intune, which I think will be, you'll be very interested in. But if you haven't yet, I would call your attention to, to, to read that quote there on the side uh, from Satya, meaning they're driving to get the respect of their customers by taking security and mobile device management, in this case, very, very seriously. Okay, so in a cloud world, everyone hears the cool stuff about, hey, I can now share information with people anywhere and do it very easily, and that's very true. Particularly with Office 365, they don't care what device you're using, whether it's your device or the party that you're sharing the information with if it's their device. So I could be on a Windows device sharing information with somebody on Mac or sharing some information with somebody on an Android device. It doesn't matter. So I can share information very easily and freely. Gone are the days, and if you guys remember, um, Office went through some a transition where, say, uh, a Word document was a, a dot .doc and today, and they, the transition went from a DOC to a .docx, and you had to wonder, oh my gosh, what version of Office are they on? I tell you, those, those were very frustrating days. That, that, that's gone. You don't need to worry about that. If I'm gonna share an Excel file with somebody, or a Word document that's got formatting that's specific to Word 2013, and they're gonna receive it on a, Mac, a MacBook Air with, maybe they've got Office 2011 for Mac, or maybe they don't. But nonetheless, if they click on that link, it actually will open up that document in their favorite browser, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, whatever might be on that MacBook, and it'll open up in that browser and it'll look exactly the way I want it to look. The formatting, the coloring, the layout, everything will look exactly the way I want it to look for them. And that's, that's what we're talking about, device independent and software independent. It just doesn't matter anymore. All those commercials from years ago that said, I'm a Mac and I'm a PC and all back and forth, doesn't matter anymore you can use whatever you want to send and receive and share and disseminate information with folks outside the organization. Plus the really cool thing about it is it's minimal management. From an IT's perspective, um, I, from an IT perspective, this is a very easy thing to manage and allow or delegate those permission um, modifications to, to your staff. So uh, you'll have access to um, share and, and manage permissions from a browser. There are applications that exist on the desktops that you can do that from as well. Um, and maybe you shared something with somebody and say, wait a minute, I don't wanna share it with them anymore. You can remove access and you don't have to go to an administrator who's busy with a lot of other things, uh, managing the organization from a technical perspective. You can do that right from your browser and oftentimes you do it right from your mobile device. It's very easy to handle. Um, so the, the takeaway here is I can share data with anybody I want. I can do it in a very secure way because everything's you know, encrypted in transit, encrypted at rest, and encrypted on my device. And I don't have to engage expensive technical people who are, who've got a list of other things that they're working on to share out, you know, maybe I got this contract or a sales order or something I'm looking to close a deal by the end of the day. These are ways that you can do it very easily and very securely. Finally, if you look at trying to access your information, now we talked about device independence and software independence, that's all great. But what if I'm at a trade show? And, and I've been at conferences where the Wi-Fi is just horrendous. 
and and my laptop, yeah, it works, but I can't get on the Wi-Fi to send anything because it's just everybody else is using the Wi-Fi. So I'll use typically a conference, a technical conference, particularly will have a, a bank of computers, kiosks that people can step up to and, and use. Well, I can use those, and I can use those with the assurances that my stuff is still secure. So I can use the computer at the trade show. I can use the computer at the hotel business center. All I need is internet access. And I don't care if it's a Mac or a PC, doesn't matter. I don't care if it's Windows 7 or Windows 8, doesn't matter. As long as I get internet access and a browser, it's gotta be a current browser, I can't be using IE6 or something like that. But a current browser, I'll be able to get to my mail, I'll be able to get to my files, I can manage my permissions in terms of sharing things. And it, it covers all the various services in Office 365. So whether I'm trying to connect into, say, CRM online, or I'm accessing uh, data in my OneDrive for Business folder, or I'm going to Yammer because I want to engage in a conversation, or drop a file. I got this great file. I want to drop it out and let my, my team know about it. Um, all of those capabilities are available to me from any device. Um, it really is very, very cool. And from a technical perspective, um, and maybe as an end user, if you're not, if you're not on the technical side of the house, you're on the more of the, you know, I'm using stuff that folks are giving me side of the house, you don't need to worry about a VPN. I still have customers that have a VPN today, and, and it's just, it's, it's a pain in the neck because you have to make sure that the infrastructure can support the newest devices, you gotta make sure you got a, a piece of VPN client software that can run on that device, it can be a real headache. Um, because if the device isn't updating, the firewall is updating, or my endpoint is updating, and I've got to go hit everybody else and make sure they update their stuff for the VPN, those days are done. It's all secure end-to-end, -end, everything is encrypted, and you can get to it without having a VPN or what's a virtual private network. So I'm going to jump in, and we're going to show some of these capabilities here. Um, so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. It's not smoke and mirrors. Some of these things, uh, I, you know, I'm going to point out to you where these policies exist, where you would go find the information to go implement these things. But really, this is, this is um, it, it's like a Ginsu knife. It does all sorts of things. It depends on how you want to use it. Maybe you want to cut tomatoes, and maybe you want to cut that aluminum can. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, these policies are very customizable, um, but there are policies and things that we can put in place that are templated as well. So you can start from something and modify it, or you can just use it right out of the box. So with that, I'm gonna jump out of our presentation. Let me close this. And let me open up uh, my browser. And I'm gonna start from uh, the portal. This is the Office 365 portal. So if you're a Office 365 customer, this should look very um, familiar to you. And this would be the kind of the launching off point. Of course, uh, the last webinar, we spent a lot of time on you know, how to interact with these various services. Uh, today, I'm going to spend a bit of time in this administration portal. Let me click on this, and you're going to see some information about this Office 365 tenant. Now, of course, yes, this is a demonstration tenant, but it is live. This is a real connected Office 365 environment. Um, and you can see here, I've got some, you know, I've got 24 users that haven't signed into email for 30 days. Well, that's because it's a demo tenant and 24 of those people don't really exist. So, but also realize, oh, I had, there's a service was restored to the Office 365 portal. And I can see very quickly that, you know, some engineers were doing some work on it. I can see what the updates were. So this is the kind of reporting and, and accountability that Microsoft has about their services. This wasn't planned. I just, you know, I'm clicking on it right now and I'm just seeing this information available to me. And I can see what the healthy environment looks like. And this gives me some indication of what it looked like for the last couple of days across all the services. But of course, that's, that's really not why we're in here. I just wanted to point that out to you while we were here. Uh, I'm going to click on, we're going to open up this Exchange Admin Center. And that's, that's in this next tab here. So what I want to show you is what's called data loss prevention. This is the ability to create policies to protect information, sensitive information, from leaving your organization or maybe tagging it in a particular way. If you just want to monitor what's happening, uh, you can tag stuff so you can kind of see what, uh, what's going on, with, what, what's happening in the, in the organization. So from this screen, I'm in the, what's called the Exchange Admin Center. This, of course, has to do with email. Exchange is the email server. And what I want to do is I want to go into data loss prevention. Uh, now, I've got a couple different options here in what's called compliance management. Uh, in place hold and e-discovery. The in place hold is really what I described as a litigation hold. Auditing in terms of running audit reports and seeing uh, what is, ha you know, if are people accessing things that they shouldn't be. Run a non-owner mailbox access report. So 
maybe, hey, is there an administrator out there that's doing things that they shouldn't be doing? Um, retention policies has to do with how long should I keep information around for and how do I tag that information? I've had some um, customers that wanted to journal things and journaling basically is every email that comes in and goes out of the organization, I wanna keep a copy of. It literally is a journal of email activity. And so you can create journal rules for that too. But let's go back to data loss prevention. And I wanna show you very quickly uh, how easy this is to create a policy. So I can create a policy here from the dropdown. I can import one, create a new custom one. I'm gonna start with a template because these policies can be fairly involved. I'm just gonna give it a, an easy name. How about that one? I don't need to give it a description, but I want you to just look at this, um, this list of policies, and it'll give you a short description over here to the right about each of them that they've got and what it, what it entails. So these are, well, we're starting with Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Israel, Japan. Uh, here's one that makes sense to me, the PCI data security. This happens to be about credit card numbers and debit card numbers. So I could very easily put in place a policy that says, don't let my people send an email that contains something that looks like a credit card, num uh, credit card number. That's a very, very cool thing to have and very easy to implement. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the UK, let's keep going. Okay, now we've got a bunch of US-based um, policy templates that we can choose from. So, uh, FTC, Graham Leach, uh, uh, HIPAA, uh, personally identifiable information. So this would be social security numbers, driver's, driver's license numbers. And, and I can very easily say, all right, let's pick on this one. More options, I want to enable this policy now and I wanna use policy tips. And policy tips basically says, well, if somebody's in their email and they uh, try, they, let's say they have an email that they're forwarding to somebody outside the organization, and it looks like in the body of this message, there appears to be a driver's license number. It will actually put a screen tip or a policy tip right up there on the screen in their email client saying, hey, you know what, this looks suspicious. Your administrator is preventing you from sending it. <laughs> Uh, and it will not let them send it, but it will tell them why, right? Um, or it'll say, it probably will say also, and this person is outside your organization, of course, because we could create the policy that says, if you send something like a driver's license number to somebody else inside the organization, that's okay. Uh, but if it's somebody outside the organization, of course, it'll throw these 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 uh, couple of different issues. So I'm gonna go ahead and click save, but this is probably gonna take just a, uh, it may take a minute or so to, to, to build. So I'm actually gonna click back here and I'm gonna look at one other example. I, I, I'll try to come back and I'll show you where this will pop up here. The other thing that we have here is the ability to do mobile device management. I'm, I'll pop back over to the Office 365 portal. This is the place that we started out initially. This is the, the portal page for administrators with the dashboard. Well, you'll notice I've got mobile devices listed here and in my settings that I can I can look at. This particular tenant happens to be managed by Microsoft Intune, which is really what I wanted to show you as an example today. But as I mentioned in the presentation, you have mobile device management capabilities as part of Office 365. What's really kind of cool about this is it's showing how Intune and Office 365 are connected, they're integrated. It knows that my business is managed by Microsoft Intune. So I don't, I have better capability in Intune. I don't need to worry about what's in 365. I have all of that plus what's in Intune. So I'm gonna go ahead, I, if I click the link here to open up the Microsoft Intune Administrator Console, it opens up this dashboard here. And this, of course, is just a launching off point, much like the portal point, uh, page was for Office 365. And in here, I've got all sorts of different things I can I can manage. Oh, yeah, let's, let me, oh. Well, let's go ahead and open that up again. Pardon me. I guess that's a nice security provision to have that it will time out my session. Oh, while well, we're waiting on that, yep, sure enough, here is our data loss prevention um, policy. Um, this one has, happens to be about personally identifiable information. Okay, so it gives me a little descriptor here on the side. I can enforce it, it's, it's, it's um, policy tips uh, are enabled, that's why it's uh, grayed out, I can change these other ones here. If I wanted to go look at it and edit it, I have the different things in here about the rules and what is it adhering to. 
okay? So scanning inside and outside, scan text limit, all different rules that I can apply to this policy and modify if, if I want to. Again, I started with a data loss prevention policy template that now I can go modify for my own business's needs. So let's, let's flip back here. It looks like Intune has now opened up. Sure enough, okay, good deal. So I can do all sorts of things here in the Intune dashboard, but I wanna go to policies. And in here, I've got a couple of different options. Now currently, again, this is the demo tenant, so I don't have any policies currently deployed, but we're gonna go ahead and create a couple of them. So if I look at the uh, policies here for configuration, I'm gonna go add one, and it, like the data loss prevention policies, I'm, I can start with a little bit of, uh, of some basis here. So I can create some custom ones, but I can also create some that are specific to various aspects of my devices. Now, um, just so I make it very clear, I'm now very specifically talking about mobile device management. Data loss prevention will cover me for both my mobile devices and my, my Outlook clients, say, or other capabilities in, in these services. Right now, we're looking at mobile device management. So I've got options here for iOS, so that'll be iPhone and iPad. I've got options here for Android devices. You can see here the Samsung Knox. That was uh, one of the recent uh, security uh, capabilities in the Samsung Edge, uh, I think it's the S6. Um, those capabilities exist. Um, so you've got some options here that you, can, that you can play with. One of the things that we're going to do is I wanna look at the iOS devices here, and I'm gonna open up what's called a, a configuration policy. So let's go ahead and create a policy and see what options we've got. So of course, we're gonna give this one a name too. And I can give it a description if I want to. This is a, just a friendly uh, entry of, of words that I can remind myself of what the heck is this policy. But this is actually kind of cool. So I can actually publish what applications I want to make available, or let's say these are the applications that are compliant to my organization. And I'm by doing that, I'm also saying if it's not listed here, other applications are not allowed to deal with my corporate data. So for example, um, I wanna say Word, um, Office for iPad. And again, I'm, this is just free text. I'm just typing in what it is. Uh, the publisher is Microsoft. And now this says app URL. What you do here is you actually go out to say the Google Play store or you go to the iTunes store or the Windows store and you pick up what the URL is of the application you wanna add. And of course, I've just to save myself some typing and some time. This is the URL from the Apple Store for the Word app for iPad. You can see that right here in the URL. I'll go ahead and click OK. And now it's added that. So on my devices, as I employ this policy, my devices will allow the Word app to run and work with my corporate data. Um, I also have the option for kiosk machines, and kiosk machines basically are um, devices that are in supervised mode. Uh, we won't go into that in detail here, but I wanted to call attention to the fact that I can now, it's like publishing an application to an, uh, a device that says if this application is there, yep, this one's good, allow it to work with the corporate data. Um, let's go ahead and hit that and go back to our compliance policies. This one actually is kind of cool, not application policies, but this is where I'm gonna get a lot of opportunity to look at how the device is configured. So, and notice here on some of these options, for example, require a password to unlock the mobile device. This one, this one policy, this one rule, will apply to both Windows Phone, iOS, Android, and Android devices with Samsung Knox. Um, in addition, I've got other options down here. So, I can now create a policy to secure the actual device in terms of password management. Um, advanced settings here, uh, password expiration, you know, give it 41 days. After 41 days, that password expires. It'll begin to prompt the, in, the, the person with the device that they need to update their password. So I can have the password, um, you know, update and, and be managed automatically with a policy. Uh, if you want to specify a, val a, a value for different policies and how the password should be um, provided, um, just at least numbers, at least has um, letters, or it has both letters and numbers, and maybe you wanna have letters, numbers, and symbols. So you now can create a policy on these devices that says this is the kind of password I'm going to require for devices to interact with my data. Um, encryption of those devices, are they encrypted or not? Jailbroken devices. So you can buy devices that have been, you know, AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile, they all offer, say, an iPhone. 
And if you buy it from T-Mobile, you really only can use it with T-Mobile. Well, there's a capability to get a jailbroken phone, and you can use it anywhere you want, or you can you can also jailbreak a phone and say, I want to install my own stuff. Don't you know? Don't let Apple manage this device. I want to manage it. And you kind of break and open the operating system of the device. Well, you can prevent jailbroken or rooted devices from connecting and accessing your data. If it if it has that if that device is connecting to me and it looks like it's jailbroken or it looks like it's rooted the system will not allow that device to interact with your data. Um, as well, if I wanted to create email profiles on a device, so I can say this email profile for Exchange Online uh, is the one to be used by this device for my data. If that doesn't have one configured, no, no, don't let that device have an email um, that will interact with my data. So lots of different ways that we can use policies to secure devices um, that might be interacting. Again, bring your own device, I've got people coming up that I'm hiring, they've got an iPhone, they've got an Android device, they may have a Windows phone. How do I deal with my corporate data on those devices when they leave the building? Uh, or perhaps when that person leaves the, the company, how do I deal with securing that and removing my data from there? And that's how, this, is, this is some examples of how you would do that. Now, with the other thing we talked about was sharing information outside of your organization. So there are different ways we can do this. And I want to show you uh, uh, two of them. Uh, one of them has to do really with collaborating with people outside. So inside the organization, I think we can all imagine what that might look like. What I want to show you is uh, the social application called Yammer. Let me bring that up here. And this happens to be the Rosebud one. So it's I'm logged in as myself. Um, Melissa is here in our webinar. She's answering questions for us. So I've got different things going on here, but I want to call your attention to several aspects of Yammer. This isn't a Yammer presentation, uh, but I want to call attention to the fact that Yammer as a social platform to interact with people, um, I can connect and interact with folks both inside and outside of my organization almost so seamlessly, I don't even realize it's happening. For example, on the left-hand side here, these are various uh, networks uh, that I am connected to. So there's an Office 365 network, an Office 365 Partners network. Now these aren't mine, these are Microsoft. There's a Microsoft Education Partner network, and if I went in there, I would see the groups that were um, in that network. Uh, this PSR Religious Education Network, this happens to be a customer of mine, that's a church, and they have a Yammer site for their parents to interact with the teachers and what their kids are learning at the church for religious education. That's not part of Rosebud, that's part of my customer. And I could go in there and that's their network and they have various groups broken out by grade. In addition, this is a, this is a, my kid's school, it's an advisory council that I'm part of, and we have a Yammer group for the advisory council. Uh, so these are not only Rosebud networks and groups, but this also is, these are groups and networks outside of Rosebud I can get to very, very easily. What I wanna show you though is how easy it is to create a network. So I'm going to create an external network. I need to give it a name. And it's interesting here, the name is kind of important. It's like registering a domain name. So I need to be careful. I'm sure if I type in test, that one's already in use. But if I put in test RBT Socius, I'm sure that one's available. Sure enough, there it is. And some permissions. So do I want to make this available and open to anybody so that anybody that's part of this network can invite others? I don't want to do that. Perhaps let's say it's a management group. And, or it's a project group with a key third party or key vendor uh, or key customer that I'd like to make sure it's just only certain people can get access to this group. So only administrators of the group can allow others to join. And maybe I want to say, you know, anybody from my own organization can join this group and certainly I can just click the checkbox there and go. And let's create the network. There we go. There's our new network. How easy was that? And now I can go through and start to add users. So let me go into the admin area, go to user management, and I'm into inviting users. And I simply would type in people's email addresses. I don't need to add any special verifications or any special authentication. The site is already encrypted. I've got the little padlock here in the top. I've got the HTTPS here on the, on the left, so it's a secure website. I can just add email addresses here in this box and have people start joining. Um, I can also do a bulk update of users in terms of um, you know, adding people into the environment through a, a CSV file. So if I had hundreds or thousands of people I wanted to add to the group, I could do that. Um, so there's some, some neat things here. I can monitor for keywords. 
I can provide some various security settings. In terms of user management though, what's really neat is I can, you see here, remove and block user. If I had people that were part of the group, I could, I could choose to remove them from the group or block them as an administrator of the network. Uh, further, um, I, can, I can manage um, who and what areas of the network that people can access. So some really interesting things here that if I, as an administrator, say that um, one of my cohorts can create a network in Yammer, I can let them manage it on their own. I don't have to manage it for them. It's their network, their group. They know how to deal with it, and they can, they, they can do it on their own. The nice thing, too, about inviting outside people is I don't have to manage user accounts and passwords. If I send something, an email, an invitation to somebody to join this group, and they don't, they don't know anything about Yammer, they don't have a Yammer account, um, it would be just the same as a lot of other cloud services. It would prompt them to create a user account and a password. So it would be their email address and, their, and a password that they create. But now Yammer and that individual are managing that. I don't need to. I just manage whether or not that person has access to the group. So if they want to change their password, or if they want to, um, or if they forget their password, they have a, a portal they go through in Yammer to do that on their own. I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to worry about answering emails about change my password for me. All of that is done by the by the other party and Yammer, that, and they're managing it for me. So really, really easy. So I, this is a this is an external group, and if I wish I had all of you guys, I could just throw you in here, and we'd see everybody in the Yammer group. But that's as easy as it can be in terms of interacting with people outside the organization. And I think what you saw from the previous view, let me go back to the Rosebud um, Yammer portal here. This should look like a, a very familiar interface for uh, a news feed, right? There are other social applications that look very similar to this. So anyway, let's, um, let me go out of here. Let's come back. And I want to show you one last thing really quick uh, in the browser in terms of OneDrive for Business. We covered this a little bit last time. But OneDrive for Business is cloud storage of documents. So uh, like other services that are available online, I can have a storage of my files in the cloud so they're backed up. They synchronize down to my desktop. So if I'm not um, online, I can still deal with my, my documents. But I can also share them very easily like other cloud services uh, that are out there. Um, this is a marketing campaign implementation task. This is a little Excel file. If I click the little ellipses here, I have the option to share. And it brings up a little little uh, wizard that says, hey, give me the email address of people you want to share with. Tell me whether or not they can edit or view. Do you want to include a personal email message with the invitation? Do you want to require them to sign in? If I click this checkbox, if the party doesn't receiving the message and they're outside my organization, if they don't have uh, a Microsoft account, um, this has gone through several different name changes. It's called uh, Windows Live. Microsoft Passport, Windows Live ID, it's the same same thing. If they don't have a Microsoft account, it will prompt them to create one. And just like Yammer, that system takes care of authentication, takes care of password management, so I don't have to deal with all of that. Um, but I do want to require them to sign in. This is not a this is not a hogs feast. Just go at it. You know, I want you to sign in um, to make sure that you have the right credentials, and it would it would take care of that for me. And if of course if I say this person can only view, I still want them to sign in. But of course, they can only view. They can't edit any of the files that are there. I can also say get a link. This is a really, really easy thing to do. If I just want to simply share this document with somebody, you know, I don't want them to have to sign in. I don't want to go through all this stuff. Don't make them click other links in the email. Just click this link and you'll see the file. That's what I can do here. So I can copy and paste this in the email message and send them to them. In addition, if I wanted them to be able to do the same thing, but I also wanted them to be able to edit it, and I want to call your attention to something I mentioned earlier, I can send them this link. They can receive it on their iPad or their Android device. They'll open up the link in their favorite browser, whatever they selected as default. And I don't know what it is, and quite honestly, I don't really care. But when they open up this link, this particular one that I've highlighted, they'll be able to edit the file. So this being an Excel file, they're going to see Excel in the browser. They'll have formulas charts and graphs and all sorts of cool stuff because it is Excel. The browser is being driven by Excel web services, which sits in the background in Office 365. I don't have to worry about, do they have Excel? Is it Excel 2010, 2013, Excel for Mac? Does not matter. And they can get it while they're at the soccer field or waiting in the doctor's office on their iPad. It just doesn't matter. They will get it anyway. Okay, and finally, I can see from this view, who am I already sharing this with? Now, this, this one hasn't been shared with anybody right now, but if I were sharing this file, I would see them listed, and I would have the opportunity to stop sharing. So as an end user, 
I can manage permissions to this file on my own through the browser. Maybe I forgot when I got on the plane I was supposed to stop sharing a file. When I land, I get to the airport, I open up, you know, or I go to a kiosk, or I go to a hotel business center, and I stop it from their computer. It's the same thing. I don't even have to use my own computer to do this. Very, very easy, very cool stuff to be using. So let me close that, and I want to come back to our presentation. And we'll see if we've got some questions here. So let me start this. So I'm going to have to flip the screen around just real quick. There we go. Okay, so uh, Cheryl, I'll throw it back over to you if you don't mind, if you've got any questions. Sure. Um, and just to remind everyone, you can either raise your hand and we'll unmute your line. You can ask your question or um, you can just submit it through the GoToWebinar question box and we will field those over to Greg. And um, a couple of more things on this slide. Uh, to learn more about the value, please visit our website. Also, the next webinar in our series is Millennial Change and Its Impact on Sales and Marketing Operations. And that will be on June 4th from 1 to 2. Carrie Robbins' contact information is shown, as well as Greg's, if you think of anything after the presentation. Greg, we do have a question here. Someone wants to know how does encrypt, encrypted email work? Oh, absolutely. So um, encrypted email is included with Office 365 and the enterprise plans. And what this means is I can send an email. Perhaps it does have um, information in it that otherwise should be kept secure. But I do need to email it to somebody outside. I can send them a specially tagged email that when the recipient, the other party, gets the message, it basically pops up and says, hey, you've received an encrypted message from Greg Trainer. Uh, click the link here to retrieve the message. And it actually will, once the person clicks the link, it will bring them out to a secure website. It actually is Outlook Web App, which is one of the services that Office 365 customers have to view their email in the browser. It brings them out to the browser inside of Outlook Web App, and now they can see the message. What, what, what's important about that is that message, while I'm sharing the information with somebody on the outside, it actually doesn't hand the information off to, say, their email client or their smartphone, right? If they have a, an iPhone or they have an Android phone, uh, that message is, the, the, the content of that message doesn't actually exist on that device. It still exists in the cloud on Microsoft's encrypted environment, their servers, but the person has to come to that environment to deal with it. They can, they can respond to it. Um, they can, they can tr retrieve attachments from it. But the idea is it keeps the message encrypted entirely so that I don't, need, again, I don't need to have to worry about what the security or safeguards of, are of the machine that this is landing on or the device that my message might land on. I don't need to concern myself with that because I know that the email will be encrypted and it'll be kept private and secure inside of this cloud environment by making the recipient kind of go retrieve or go look at that message inside of the same environment. So it, it keeps it well under control. I hope that answers the question. All right, we've got one more here. Says, Does mm -hmm. e-discovery and data loss prevention only cover Exchange Online? Um, no. So great question. Um, near the end of last year, Microsoft made an announcement um, that data loss prevention was getting enhanced. And, and again, data loss prevention is that capability to prevent um, certain types of information from leaving the organization, like a credit card number or uh, a social security number, right? So, and that, was, that has been there really from the beginning for Exchange. Microsoft has now extended that capability through to SharePoint and consequently OneDrive for Business. And OneDrive was that thing I was showing there at the end where I was sharing that file with somebody on the outside. Imagine if that file had social security numbers in it. Uh, and I, I really shouldn't be sharing that file outside the company. Data loss prevention would have prevented me from doing that. It actually will scan the files that are out there, tag the ones that are suspicious or that may, um, may have information in it that we don't want to let out of the organization, and it will uh, therefore prevent the information from being shared. So uh, the question is no. It covers both Exchange, SharePoint, and OneDrive at the moment. Uh, eDiscovery, of course, I think you mentioned that as well, eDiscovery, covers all the, the, the main services of Office 365. It still, to this day, 
does not cover Yammer, which was one of the things we showed here in the in the demonstration. Um, and and that's important to make sure that you know trade secrets aren't being uh, shared in a Yammer environment or you know the inside training idea from from Wall Street. Uh, we want to prevent that from happening. And from a Yammer standpoint, an administrator can export the information from the Yammer group or the Yammer network and they can feed that information into the e-discovery tools that are available in 365 to make sure that there's strict adherence to e-discovery. Um, it just is not automatically implemented, but I, I see that changing here uh, soon. And there's, there's no reason why it shouldn't be able to be covered by, by the same services, same capabilities. So thank you. It does look like that's all the questions and we are about out of time here, Greg. So I okay. think we're ready to conclude. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And if you would, you can close us up. Yeah, sounds good. Again, everyone, the um, next presentation is listed um, here on the slide and contact information as well. We'll be following up afterwards with a copy of the recording from today's presentation so that you can share with any team members. And again, thanks for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.